Welcome to episode one of Empathic Action, a YouTube channel devoted to stories of everyday heroes doing good in the world. Tune in to feel lighter on your toes and be inspired to join the Empathic Action revolution. I'm your host, Anita Novak. Today, you'll meet Jennifer, a woman who left a successful career to launch a nonprofit organization dedicated to empowering women in the developing world. Her empathic action work is lifting women and their families out of poverty, and Jennifer's never been happier. Hi, this is Anita Novak for Empathic Action, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Jennifer Lonigan, who is the founder and executive director of Artistry Sud. It's actually quite a full circle because I met Jennifer when I did an interview with her um, about empathy and social entrepreneurship for my PhD some years ago. So welcome back to the camera, Jennifer. Mm, thank you. <laughs> um, Jen, I love the story that you tell about how you got into the world of social entrepreneurship in the first place. Could you take us back to sort of your journey? Yeah, sure. The shortest version I can tell is that I had a, I had, I had a really good career. I had a long career as a teacher and I, I mean, longish. And then I moved into public history. I'm actually a historian. So I was working uh, at, the, at you know, our National History Museum, and then I, I was working for uh, the government. And I, I had a really good job for a historian. I was, you know, like my job was, was great. And um, a couple things happened. I, I, my job was great, but I hated my life. Mm. And um, I, it took me a long time to realize that I hated my life. I couldn't quite figure out why I hated it because it seemed like everything looked pretty good mm. you know I had this really good job for historian I, I was working for the government I made good money I had great benefits I had this nice house but I was like some something was you know not not working and I also um had traveled to the developing world and um you know I, I mean I, I yeah I, I just sort of saw things there that I was shocked by and I realized that other people in the world don't have opportunities the way that we do and I kind of over time those two things sort of collided the the part where I felt like I wasn't doing things that mattered in my life and I realized that that was kind of the, the thing that was missing and, and and this this need this you know realization I had that other people you know that, that I had I felt I had to do something to kind of redress that imbalance in the world so I I, I looked for ways to do my part to to, to to change things. So practically speaking, you came back from several trips overseas. You're working in your plush government job. You have a PhD. You're a historian. You feel like you're contributing to society, but you're unhappy. Um, and and what were the next steps that you actually took? You know, there was a long period of kind of reflecting and doing. You know, trying to think. Okay, well, great. I'm unhappy, but what what would make me happy? So I actually spent some time reflecting on what had made me happy in my life, like when I had been happiest. And the results kind of surprised me. I realized that I was happiest when I was somehow contributing to other people's like mm -hmm. lives. And I just, you know, that was, I was, I mean, I feel kind of dumb about it now, but I was really surprised by that. So I, I was looking for, I spent some time, like I spent about a year maybe kind of thinking like, okay, what's the intersection of my skills, my interests, like what I bring to the table and what, what really needs doing in the world, you know? You asked yourself the introspective questions. What makes me happy when I'm in service to others? I think I can be in service to a lot of women in the developing world by bringing my uh, background and skills and energy and time and enthusiasm to helping. But then you have to actually submit a resignation letter and take the plunge financially into sort of the unknown. Mm. You know, there might be people watching that are in similar positions and aren't, don't have yet the moment of courage. Could you just talk to that, what it took? In some ways I think of... I think I, it was a survival move for me, you know? I really feel like I don't think I could have, I mean, I guess I could have lived continuing in that job, you know? And I would have lived on antidepressants, on alcohol, on, I mean, I had, you know, I had all kinds of, I had back problems and neck problems. And I mean, I had, um, I was constantly taking, you know, all certain medicines for all, like, it was like, <laughs> there's all kinds of like physical and mental symptoms. And I don't know, I, I don't. I mean, yes, it does take some take some courage to leave to to leave like that super comfortable life. But in another way, it's like it was really not a comfortable life. You know, yes, materially it was much more comfortable, but but in other ways, it was it was really not. So, so nearly a decade later, yeah, are you happier? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change it for the world. I'm like lamenting some situations right now, but there is no part of me that wishes I was 
back where I was. You know, there's no part of me that regrets that. Because I think actually, because once you make those decisions, like I live, you know, I live very modestly compared to how I used to live. I was never very excessive, but you know, when you're just earning a super comfortable living, like I, I didn't, you know, I had, I had trouble spending the money I was making, you know, I had more money than I needed. And, and I think that when you begin to pare down or when you, I made this choice and I think that actually it's possible to live really beautifully and creatively with so much less, like we have so much more than we need. Mm -hmm. We just do. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people's issues around courage are that, you know, it's really like, will I have the means? But the fact is that, you know, we don't need, like, we don't actually need that much. Mm. So it's really about coming. I think to me, a lot of it is really about coming to terms with the fact that we actually live with a lot of excess, you know, we don't actually, and that's not the same as abundance. You know, what do you really need in your life? You need like lots of love and happiness and kindness and generosity. And you don't actually need several cars so take us back to the first iteration quickly of artistry sued and where it is today so my first idea was i thought okay i can i'll open a store it'll be sort of a window on what they do i'll buy things directly from women artisans i'll sell them and at the same time it'll be a kind of you know um like a kind of gallery space where i can explain how things work because a lot of a part of the issue is i mean that i think that things that women do um, are not very valued by society. So women tend to create textiles or the things that they make, you know, are not valued. So part of it was that I really wanted to have this kind of showcase onto what women make, what women do, and what goes into weaving or textile production or things like that. I, I opened the store, um, I can't remember how many years ago now, and I opened the store, but I had absolutely, <laughs> I had absolutely no experience I mean, I barely shopped. I never worked in a store. I didn't have one of those, you know, summer jobs where you fold clothes at the Gap. I didn't. I didn't do any of that. So I don't know. Some for some reason, I thought, you know, like I know what a store is. You'll be a retailer. So, yeah, I thought, you know, hey, how hard can this be? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard. So now, uh, Artistry Sued uh, provides training. Mm-hmm entrepreneurship training to women in the developing world. You've Mm -hmm. had a couple of pilots in Bolivia and Chile. Mm -hmm. And tell us what that um, five-day training is about. The idea is to take women, we we work with women who already have existing craft skills. We're not teaching them skills. They have technical skills and we, and they already are to some extent selling, you know, maybe it's like one or two pieces a year or something. So they, it's, it's mostly that they're clothing themselves and their families. Um, but we, we take that type of artisan and then we, we, we help them to kind of grow their business so that it's more sustainable. And the five day, we do an intensive five day program and the five days they learn, um, you know, they learn stuff that seems really simple. Uh, they learn how to innovate new products because they tend to be very good at what they do, but they're not so good at innovating. And they're especially not good at figuring out how to innovate something that somebody will actually want to buy. So we try to get them, we try to build their awareness around the fact that like there, there may be market trends and needs and how to find information about that, how to find kind of independent information about that and how to actually have conversations with potential customers when you're in that environment. Because many times they go to little like kind of local fairs or things like that. So they're, they do have an opportunity to interface with clients, but they, you know, for many of the women that we work with, it's like, it's a revelation to them that they can actually engage a client in a conversation that can then help them develop a product that could be interesting for clients, you know. And then we have a, a coaching program for a year whereby they're coached uh, remotely, like by, by phone, um, by artist suit volunteers here who are trained to to, vo- to help them uh, sort of meet monthly targets. So you know on a personal level and anecdotally the impact that Artistry Suit is having, but you can also put it within context of broader um, systems change that's happening with the empowerment of women so long as they get educated or are offered skills training. Could you give us a little bit of information about how the kind of work that you're doing has transformative capacity for women generally? There's a couple things that happen. When they begin to generate their own revenue, Um, First of all, they have the means and they tend to prioritize uh, things that, you know, I think most people consider important, right? Like they prioritize their children's education, they prioritize health, they prioritize nutrition and, and sort of peripherals like if their kid walks 40 minutes to school every day, they want to buy them shoes so they can, you know, that kind of thing. So, so the one of the things is really this concrete kind of uh, impact on at a household level. 
Um, but, but the research also shows and suggests that women also begin to have this kind of a broader influence because they're now seen as something that has value, not something that like costs money to maintain, but something that brings value. And so they begin to increase their influence, not only in their own household, but also over community. Um, and that, that in turn has other like effects. So it's, there's all kinds of, this is called the multiplier effect, in fact, because there's like such a big, broad range of things. You know, uh, infant mortality is reduced, maternal mortality is reduced. Um, there's, in fact, there's like, there's there's impacts on GDP. There's all kinds of economic impacts, not not only in their own household, but, you know, really like at a, at a national level. So there's, there's pretty big, you know, there's a pretty big bang for your buck if you invest in women. Hmm. And... Personally, Mm -hmm. you've been through several rounds of these training programs, and I know we've talked about this before and and shared some tears over it. Could you share with the audience some touching stories of changes you've seen in women that have gone through your training? You know, the women come into the program and they kind of self-identify and they say, okay, the question, you know, we do sort of an icebreaker and they're like, they have to say who they are and they're... They all sort of identify easily as moms, I'm a mom, I'm a weaver, you know, really kind of nuts and boltsy things. And by the end of the training program, on the fifth day, we redo the exercise and the women are now saying things like, you know, I'm a businesswoman, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a leader. And it's really, um, it's just, it's hard to like describe the impact of watching people just begin to see themselves completely differently. Mm in five days but they they don't they no longer see themselves like this they see themselves as like what's possible for them you know and it's miraculous so as a final (laughs) question um i think you know where i stand on the whole empathy issue that empathy is very different than pity and sympathy and um, even compassion and that a lot of work um that's being done philanthropically in international development and social entrepreneurship uh, is is unfortunately still predicated on a pity paradigm. Where, oh, you poor people, mm-hmm. right? And so what you've just described to me is a perfect example of doing empathic action work because on one hand, you're providing entrepreneurship training that is creating real impact in the lives of these women and their families and their communities. And on the other hand, I can only assume, and this is what I'll ask about, that they are informing you about life because you're watching transformation and you yourself are a social entrepreneur. So how has it changed the way that you take risks and, you know, have greater courage in life? And Wow. Um, I think that's such a big question. Um, I think I feel, uh, you know, it's really inspiring I don't know if this answers your question, but I feel really lucky to be around people who are willing to take risks all the time, you know, because that's what they're doing. They're, they're in this place and I, I, it's a, it's a privilege to be around people who are willing to, to put themselves on the line and that's what they do. A few weeks ago on International Women's Day, Artistry Sud hosted its Tales of Triumph fundraiser. They raised over $20,000, all of which will be directed towards their next five-day training program in Chile. To support their incredible work, please visit their website and make a donation. Thanks for watching Empathic Action, and I hope you'll join us for episode two when you'll meet Henry, a young man fighting ISIS with empathy. Until then, remember that anyone can become more empathic with practice. So be on the lookout for empathic action opportunities. They're everywhere.